Tonight we're going to be talking about the gospel for parenting and discipleship. It may seem kind of odd for some of you to add these two topics together, but here's why they go well together. Our children do not belong to us. They were created by God for his purpose. They are his possession and parents are entrusted with these blessings from the Lord. Being entrusted with something that is not yours means you're a steward. A better title for us parents could be ambassador because as parents, we are ambassadors of Christ. Our role as an ambassador is simple, to represent the one who sent you. And this is the purpose, whether you are a parent or not, to represent the one who sent you, to put his message, values, and character on display is to give him glory. And as we've learned, the chief end of man is to glorify God. As parents, we have the unique opportunity to glorify Him in the area of raising children. However, even if we do not have the responsibility of raising children, we are still called to make disciples. And making disciples is essentially spiritual parenting. We are called to teach the next generation to love His Word, trust Him, and obey Him. The Apostle Paul, who didn't have any biological children, had many spiritual children. He called Timothy his beloved son in the faith and the salutations in both letters written to Timothy. And he called Titus my true child in a common faith. Parents with children at home, you are called to disciple your children by bringing them up in the way of the Lord. And if this is the only discipleship that you can do right now, that's okay. I know sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough if I'm not in a committed discipleship relationship with other people around my age, or if I'm not evangelizing or going on mission trips or doing these other things. But God has you in your place with your children right now, and that is something that we can be thankful for and faithful to. Parents with grown children who have left their father and mother, you are called to disciple your children by encouraging and loving them and faithfully praying for them. Spiritual parents, which is all of us who call ourselves Christians, we are called to disciple the next generation by teaching them and supporting their parents. Those of us who are members of a local church have the specific responsibility of discipling the children there. I want to pause here because although we are going to be talking about parenting, I think it's important to note that discipleship does not and should not always have to be an older person mentoring a younger person. We know this isn't the case because in Paul's discipleship of Timothy, he encourages Timothy to teach and disciple others despite his young age. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Wisdom and faith often come with age, but the dynamic of their discipleship relationship is that of a mature Christian discipling an infant Christian. 1 Peter 2 2 through 3 says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Growing up, my grandma always had chocolates in the house, and my grandpa made the best homemade Oreo ice cream. I knew whenever I went to my grandparents, I would get a taste of something sweet. When I was about six years old, I was staying with my grandparents at their lake house. She had these brown things in the pantry that looked like gooey, melty candies. I was supposed to be getting flour to make pancakes, but I stuck my finger in the gooey mess and tasted it. I was trying to be sneaky, but there was no covering up the disgust on my face and in my voice. I had to come clean and tell her I tried her disgusting candy. But turns out it wasn't candy at all. It was roach bait. My grandma panicked, called my mom in poison control, and kept making me rinse my mouth out. Thankfully, everything turned out fine, but it could have been a very dangerous situation. Nowadays, these kinds of roach killers have plastic traps around them, probably because of kids like me. 
The point is, young children need a protector, and the same is true of young or immature Christians. At the moment of our conversion, we get a taste of the goodness of the Lord, and we long for more. But we need someone to walk alongside us, encouraging us to take bites of solid food, experiencing the joy of life's sweet delicacies with us, enduring the sour or bitter bites we take, and protecting us from ingesting poison. My grandma happened to be the one there who helped me, but this also could have been my brother or sister, or even a four-year-old who had already learned the lesson of not eating roach bait. So if age is not necessarily a factor in discipleship, what are the qualifications to be a disciple? One, we need to be a disciple of Jesus because we are called to follow after him. And this looks like self-denial and continual submission, obedience, service, evangelism, living in accordance to God's word, which is empowered through the work of the spirit, having a love for other people, enduring suffering, and having sound doctrine. Secondly, we need to disciple others, and we do this by giving them our time through demonstration or modeling or mentoring, through supervision, teaching, and duplication. When we talk about duplication, it's important to note that we can't disciple everyone, but we want to disciple those that we are in a discipleship relationship with in a way that equips them to make disciples. If we can disciple one or two people wholeheartedly, then they can disciple one or two, and this makes more faithful disciples than us trying to disciple everyone in our lives. We must be a disciple in order to disciple. My son wanted to take piano lessons, and when he asked to do this, I didn't go to a football coach. I went to a piano teacher. There may be the best coach in the world who could teach him to pass and catch and tackle, but that coach can't teach my son what he wants to learn. In the same way, we can't teach people about Jesus if we don't follow him ourselves. Now, I can play a few songs on the piano, and I could teach him how to play those songs, but I wouldn't be able to teach him the notes or counts. He needs someone who understands music, not just a few piano keys. I've been learning some with him so that I can help him when he practices at home. But to begin, I had to find someone with that skill, someone with a good reputation, and a personality that would mesh with his. The same is true of discipleship. Sometimes we have to refer out. I think that my doctrine is pretty sound, but I can't always answer someone's questions. The good news is I have elders and wiser brothers and sisters in Christ that I can turn to when I need help. I've experienced some suffering and loss in my life, but I don't have much experience with cancer. While I can offer prayer and sympathy to someone who's facing a cancer diagnosis, I can't disciple them through that. I need to connect them with someone who has gone through or is going through it. We shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge our limitations within a discipleship relationship, whether it's with our kids or with someone else. It's more beneficial to tell someone, I think you should go talk to so-and-so about that, or let's go to the elders together and see if they can help us answer that question, than to try and solve it on your own. While we may be called to disciple someone, God doesn't put that burden on us alone. We have the church for help, and this is why it is so important that we should know each other and allow ourselves to be known. Another example is when my husband was in optometry school. They had a mentorship program where someone from the year ahead was paired with someone from the year prior. It so happened that my husband's mentor also went to the church we ended up going to, and him and his wife were in our small group. They were going through everything with school just a year ahead of us, and they had their first son two months before we had ours. We meshed well and helped each other through a lot of struggles because we were going through a lot of the same things. This friend's mother was diagnosed with an aggressive cancer that didn't have many treatment options. Of course, we prayed for her and the family, and we helped how we could, 
but we just couldn't fully experience what they were feeling because it wasn't something we had gone through. However, there was an older lady in the church who also had cancer, and she just so happened to be their neighbor. The faith and peace that she maintained throughout her battle and right up to her death was a source of hope and encouragement to them. Also, while all of this was going on, I worked with a girl whose dad had recently passed away from cancer. I was talking to her and we put it together that her dad went through some clinical trials and pushed for legislation to approve a cancer medication that was able to give our friend's mom a few extra months to live. This girl didn't believe in Jesus, but just making this simple connection allowed me to have a conversation with her about faith and hope that would have otherwise never happened. I say all this to say, we need to know each other's stories. Knowing our friend's mom's story allowed me to disciple someone that I didn't know how to approach. So I'm gonna shift gears here more to parenting now. And I think that any youth minister or someone who works with kids would back me up on this. But sometimes we don't know how to approach our kids either. They are going through changes with hormones and growth spurts. Their relationships are changing. They enter into years of dating. And sometimes they don't know how to approach us for help. Again, knowing others can help us point our kids to someone who can talk to them and offer compassion, empathy, and good advice. This doesn't take away our responsibilities as parents, but it offers multiple resources for our kids so that they always have somewhere to go for help. It teaches them the importance of church community. Again, this is why the idea of parenting and discipleship go together and why it is important for all of us. If you are someone in my church, then you are the people that I'm sending my kids to when they don't want to talk to me. Now, chances are you're probably going to tell them the same exact thing I did, but you're going to be the one that they listen to. I've seen it on social media posts and read it in books that motherhood is a woman's highest calling. While motherhood is valuable, it is not our highest calling as women. Our highest calling, everyone's highest calling, is to glorify God. So if you are not a mother, you are not of any less value than any other woman. And if you are a mother, you are not of any more value than any other woman. We are all called to glorify God, and mother or not, we can do that in part by teaching the next generation to glorify God. So, who thinks that parenting is easy? If you said yes, you're either not a parent or you're lying. Parenting is hard. Keeping kids alive is hard. And I'm coming to understand that parenting doesn't really get any easier, it just gets different. Each age and stage has its own unique challenges, and each child has their own unique personality, so what worked for one likely won't work for the other. And on top of just meeting needs and disciplining, we're trying to nurture hearts and help them navigate emotions. As we master potty training and resolving conflict without being hurtful, We also want them to cherish the Word of God. As we encourage academic and extracurricular involvement and success, we also want to encourage church participation. The task of parenting and meeting basic needs seems endless. Then we add the desire to raise our children to know and love God and others. It's a lot. And I hope I'm not the only one who's ever felt like just giving up sometimes. But parenting is a God-given gift and calling. God is using you to form not just a person, but a soul. This is a weighty calling and can seem impossible, but the key to being an effective tool in the lives of our children is to always keep the big picture of the gospel in mind. The gospel reminds us that the goal is His glory, and that's the only measure of success. No matter what season of parenting you are in, your greatest need is not found in a specific strategy or formula. Your every need is found in the gospel. But what does this look like in the day-to-day of parenting? I think we could rattle off a few proverbs about parenting, but actually the Bible doesn't go into great detail on this topic. Maybe that's why there's over 75,000 books on parenting in the market today. Not to mention the countless mommy blogs and social media influencers who claim to have the best parenting tips and hacks. 
We want instructions, but unfortunately, instead of these resources being supplemental to God's word, they become replacements. Regardless of how few parenting tips can be found in scripture or how much can be found in the world, the Bible offers all of the principles you need to parent your child as God intends. Consider Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Just in 10 verses, we are offered the framework to sufficiently guide us in the monumental task of raising children. First, we are to love God, and the expression of our love should be obedience to his word. Then, we are to teach the word of God to our children in every life circumstance and season. Rather than tying boxes with verses on our foreheads, we are to have a Bible-saturated worldview where God and his word are the filter through which we see everything in life. Modeling and teaching this biblical worldview is a means through which God will shape our children to glorify him. God's primary concern is not whether or not is whether or not our child participates in travel baseball. It's not whether or not our child grows up to be a doctor or engineer. His primary concern is the affections of our child's heart. The teaching of his word is a means to protect them against idol worship. The world is going to tell them to seek whatever makes them happy, whatever feels right, and whatever that is to our children, it can quickly become their God. Consider the Israelites. After Joshua led them into the promised land, that generation died. The Bible says in Judges 2.10 that the next generation did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. The next verse clearly reveals the repercussions of this lack of instruction from their parents. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forsook God and followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. We are after our children's hearts. We want them to know, love, and worship the living God. The sole purpose of parenting is not conversion, but as we give guidance and teach our children about idolatry, submission to authority, and character, we are showing them their need for a savior. One of the hardest, but also most freeing facts about parenting is that we cannot save our children. While we are certainly given the responsibility to instruct and discipline them, we are not meant to be their savior. Only Jesus can do that. And instead of that causing us to feel out of control, we should rejoice that the true and perfect Savior takes that burden off of us and freely puts it upon himself. Instead of letting that fact frighten us, we should hit our knees in humility and pray that our children would come to know Jesus at an early age. Because Jesus is the Savior, we don't have to dwell on our mistakes or worry about ruining our children. As God uses our children in our lives, or as God uses us in our children's lives, he uses our children to grow us as well. Our good father is after our hearts. This is seen in how he uses parenthood to sanctify us. In his brilliant design, he has allowed the intricacies of parenthood to be sort of a mirror to show us our weaknesses, sin tendencies, and need for him. Is it not true that the gift of having a newborn is realizing how self-centered and selfish we can be? The very real frustration over our helpless newborn sleep pattern or eating schedule shows us how tightly we hold on to our own preferences. Is there anything more humbling than having to admit you were wrong, apologize, and seek forgiveness from your child? When your three-year-old throws a tantrum, or your preteen complains incessantly, or your teenager shows apathy or annoyance, 
We are reminded of our own heart's attitudes before our Father. We grumble and complain. We seek self-comfort over obedience and throw a tantrum that he's not doing things our way. And this is a gift. It's his grace. And as we lean into him in these moments of weakness and frustration and introspection, we confess our need for a Savior. We pray for his Holy Spirit to empower us to overcome our sins and to better reflect our Father. And as we are sanctified and learn more about our God, we teach the next generation to do the same. To wrap up, I want to address our emotions, specifically anger. We aren't always going to have a great attitude about parenting, but I think sometimes we can brush off a cruel word or harsh tone by either blaming our children's behavior or, as women, blaming our hormones. God created us with many emotions, and it's good and healthy to allow ourselves to experience those emotions. However, Psalm 4.4 and Ephesians 4.26 both say, Be angry and do not sin. The things that cause us to sin in our anger are outlined throughout Scripture. Wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. From Colossians 3.8 Philippians 2.14 lists grumbling and arguing. Blaming and arrogance and condescendence is in Jude one sixteen, and bitterness, rage, and brawling are in Ephesians four thirty one. We know that these things are wrong, and we know that when our anger manifests itself in these ways, that it's hurtful and damaging to our children. Now, for most of us, these are not deliberate, thought out words for our children. Rather, they come out in a rash burst of anger in response to our children's disobedience or their inability to meet our expectations, whether those were spoken or unspoken, attainable or unrealistic. Proverbs 14.29 says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. When we're quick to anger and hasty to show our temper, we are being foolish. There is no understanding, no benefit of the doubt, no grace. If anger is typically sinful when we respond hastily, then the remedy is to slow down. Psalm 4, 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts, on your beds, and in silent. Take time to examine your anger away from your kids. Stop and think about what is making you angry. Is it really about what your children did or didn't do? Or is it about you, your heart, your sin? Even if your anger is justified, is the way you're showing it justified. Contrary to the list of harsh words that I had just a minute ago, Galatians 5.22 outlines the characteristics that should be evident in us as Christians, even when we're angry. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Although this scripture isn't specific to parenting, it's an example of how we can use the biblical principles to guide us in parenting. So the way that I use these is in a moment of anger, it goes something like this. One, take some deep breaths. Two, pray. This is usually just a quick, Lord help me. And three, if I'm not calm enough to respond in a way that shows the fruits of the Spirit, or if things start to get out of hand, then it's time for a mommy timeout. During this timeout, I can run through the fruits of the Spirit to see where I'm lacking. It's like running diagnostics to identify the root of a problem, then assess how it's spreading from my heart to my mind and mouth, and fight it with the right antidote. So am I responding with love? Is my joy rooted in Christ or in this circumstance? Am I maintaining peace or am I in a power struggle? Was I simply being impatient? Are my words, tone, and facial expressions kind? Am I reflecting God's goodness and his grace and mercy? Am I being a faithful steward of the children God has given me? In disciplining them in a way that strengthens their faith. Is my voice gentle? 
Am I under control? Answering these questions helps me to see where my sin is coming from so that I'm able to pray about it more specifically, find scripture to meditate on that is directly related to that issue, and be more mindful of using and showing the fruit of the Spirit I'm lacking in. There's a handout. Uh, In your handouts, there's a chart that I made based on the ways that I struggle and need to be reminded of this that may be helpful to some of you. If this isn't something that you really struggle with, then please take time to fill out the chart in the way that is most helpful to you. So our homework for this week is to look at what are your responsibilities as an ambassador of Christ in your home? If you don't have children at home, then what does that look like in your church? Next week, we'll be talking about the gospel for seasons of waiting and suffering.